I'm Julie Zenner along with Greg Grell and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The next human rights officer for the city of Duluth will begin his job during a summer of national racial tension. We'll talk with Carl Crawford about building trust and respect among all peoples. The first of two national political conventions begins next week in Cleveland. Tonight we'll talk with Republican and Democratic delegates on the eve of those conventions. And major flood damage in northern Wisconsin leads our business headlines this week. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. Greg Grell is sitting in this week for Denny, who is off enjoying vacation. And how does it feel to be on this side of the camera instead of up in the booth? Always a little different on this side of the camera, so hopefully I'll be able to handle it. Well, you always <laughs> do a nice job, and we have some good topics that you lined up. So uh, All let's right. get started. Well, thanks, Julie. It's been a difficult past few months for race relations in our country. The shooting of black men in Louisiana and Minnesota, followed by the killing of police officers at a protest in Dallas, has shocked the nation and begun anew a national dialogue. Joining us now to talk about this and other issues is Carl Crawford. He was confirmed this week as the next human rights officer for the city of Duluth. And Carl, thanks so much for being here tonight. Great, we appreciate thank you it. for having me on the show. You just come from a, a vigil uh, down at Duluth City Hall. It uh, was titled uh, Stop the Madness. Tell, tell us about that vigil tonight. It was a great vigil as the community came out to heal. And that's really what we're looking for as a nation, and of course as a community, the opportunity to, to really heal and understand human life on all aspects. Carl, is this a particularly pivotal time for uh, the Human Rights Office? Yes, it is. I think as Duluthian and as the city of Duluth, we really stand at a pivotal time, an opportunity for us to really move forward and change not only race relationships, but how you treat each other as humans, as neighbors, as co-workers mm -hmm. in this community. You've lived in Duluth for, for quite a while now. How many years? Wow, almost 25, 26. 25 years. So how, how would you rate Duluth in terms of just how it's doing in human rights? You know, I think we're doing good. There's some opportunities for growth. And what we're talking about is making good great and making great the standard. And that's mm -hmm. going to be our goal moving forward. Mm -hmm. What do you think some of the biggest challenges are right now facing the city of Duluth as you prepare to enter office as a human rights officer? Right now, one of the biggest issues that I've been hearing a lot about is housing and, of course, employment. And we know that disparities exist in those two areas. And we know that there's great people that are trying to do great jobs to close that gap. But yet those disparities still exist. So I think that's going to be a focus for the first year. Mm -hmm. For those who, people who don't really know what a human rights officer does, can, can you kind of explain you know, what you see the job being and what you bring to, to the position? Absolutely. With human rights, there are actually 30 human rights that we all have. Mm -hmm. And my job is to make sure that those are protected and kept and to educate others on what those human rights are. And the other thing is to be that voice of the small person that ha doesn't have a voice is going to be my job to help their voices be raised and help things be better in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, in this position, Carl, what do, you, what do you think that you personally bring to the table? What makes you a good fit for the human rights officer job? Hopefully my history in the community of working with di many different groups and my collaborative spirit, I believe solely in what Mary Larson said, that we're going to get there together. And not one person can get us there. And I know that there's going to be a lot of heavy lifting, but we have a pretty special community here. And we have a lot of great things going on. So there's going to be an opportunity, I think, to move forward and really bring more people to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned uh, at the top in the introduction that there have been some real challenging things going on in our state and across mm -hmm. the nation with race relations. I is it a little bit daunting to enter into this it, position and this discussion at, at, at this point in time when things are, are so tense right now and it's hard to, to even imagine how things are going to straighten out again? It, it is. Um, we're dealing with a nation right now that mm -hmm. is feeling less less that there's no hope. And I believe there is hope. 
and we have a city administration that believes there's hope and there's opportunity to change things, and that's going to be part of my job. But it's really going to take a lot of time to listen. We have to listen to the pain that's there, to the fear that's there, and then we have to have conversations to bring people to the table across their biggest divide to make sure we have that opportunity to make meaningful difference. Mm -hmm. As a black man, um, just watching these events play out, how, how has that, that been for you and how does it relate to, to your personal experience? It's been painful. Uh -huh. um, I say it all changes when it comes to your living room. Um, raising a son, a young man of color. You know, I remember the night that the shooting happened, I went outside and made sure the lights worked on his car. And I don't know if many people in the community had to do that, mm -hmm. but I had to do that to make sure that he was okay. And it, it changes everything. But understanding that we can't live in the world afraid of everything. We have to be able to go outside, do our jobs, be productive, have friendships. So the more we educate and the more we talk, the more we dispel some of that fear. Mm -hmm. Carl, what has your personal experience been with police in the Northland since you've lived here in Duluth? Mm -hmm. Has it been positive mostly? or? I would say mostly. <laughs> I, I, I have been Mine stopped. Too. <laughs> yes. I have been stopped before, but listening to how many times a gentleman Castillo was, was stopped was alarming. Um, we have a new police chief here. Uh, I think he's willing to come to the table and talk about some of these issues in meaningful terms with the community of color. Um, but I've had great friends who are police officers as well. And I think it all comes to how do you approach your job, right? How do we treat each other? That first 10 or 15 seconds sets the stage for how, it may outcome, how the outcome may come out or what may happen in that situation. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we all just really want to go home to our families. And Duluth, of course, has, has really embraced the whole idea of community policing over, over yes. the last few years. And do you feel like those, those relationships maybe are better in our Duluth neighborhoods than they might be in some other communities where, where they're having you know, more visible problems? I would say they're better, but there's still opportunity to do more. And there's ways to reach kids and reach families that are marginalized and just be able to really um, get together and get to know each other. And one thing we can do too is uh, obviously thank our officers for the job that they do every day. It's hard to shake someone's hand when the other hand is holding a fist. You just can't do it. We got to find ways for both of us to be able to shake our hands. Mm -hmm. What about the, the fact that Duluth police officers have been wearing um, body cameras for a over a year now. Does that give a, a little bit more of a, a confidence that um, if something were to happen that, that the truth comes out? Um, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the body cams are a great thing when it looks at safety. Um, I, I'm not 100% sold that it really helps those who are incarcerated or involved with the police. I think it does more to help the police to understand whether I'm doing a good job or not almost as like a better training aid to say what could we do differently in that situation. So I'm not 100% sure I sold that it's there to be a safety mechanism for a community. Mm -hmm. In some of the interviews I've read and some of the speeches you've made since you've been selected as human rights officer, you've mentioned persistent barriers pa facing people of color in Duluth. What are, what are some of those barriers, Car Carl? Well, some are education. Um, obviously, when you come from poverty, there's a different mindset. There's a different lens that you have of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. And so for some companies and some opportunities, we may look at a different way that we get different groups involved um, in education and in employment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's good f to have somebody who comes from a community of color in this position to kind of uh, you know, relate to people who are facing some of these barriers? I hope so. I think I bring a different lens to the table, a different way of looking at the world and looking at Duluth. Um, we understand that there are disparities that exist and you know, I may change different ways just on who I am, the way I was, was raised and the way I see the world. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have the full support of the administration? I know Mayor Larson has elevated this position to uh, reporting directly to her. It seems like she's taking it very seriously. Extremely seriously. And yes, I do feel I have the support, but we're building this bridge as we cross it. And that's what's amazing about it. The key thing that I think is that core team right now really sees the need to do better. And there's room that we believe that we can do better. And with community support behind us, I think we will do better. Beyond the, the communities of, of color, what are some other areas where, where human rights really come into play in the city and, and the types of situations that you see yourself maybe having to deal with now on a daily basis? I think understanding more about our community of, of disabilities, I like to call different abilities, mm -hmm. but really paying attention to how they see and experience Duluth, um, as well as looking at different genders. What are the opportunities there? And 
when they're not there, why not? And really be able to challenge and push back and look at how can our community really be better and really be great for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. Do you, do you think that this office and this position has been fairly, fairly effective at, at addressing those inequities and issues of discrimination in the community up to this point or, or areas where um, you see a real need to do better? I think I see all areas to really do better, but mm -hmm. I, I am definitely proud of the work that Bob Gritall and Meg Bayh in the past has done with this position. I think Mayor Larson raising this position up sees the importance of it in our city, especially now today, as we continue to move forward. And we would love to have more of our college graduates stay here after they graduate. And sometimes we lose the most promising graduates because they don't feel as comfortable because they are a diverse population. And we need to change that. What about the, the whole idea of um, high school graduation? Because there, there, has, there have been some real problems in the African American community mm -hmm. um, with high dropout rates in the Duluth public school system. Do you see yourself working with the school district at all in that to, to try to you know, maybe increase how people value education or, or ways to, to make them stay in school or help them stay in school or want to stay in school? Yes, I do. And I think one of the keys is once again, we still in hope. There, there has to be something at the end of graduation that our kids can grab onto and say, I can see myself do that job or be that job. But when we don't have a huge representation of people of color in positions within the community, it's hard to be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. Carl, you're a past chair of the Duluth Human Rights Commission. That must put you in a pretty strong position coming into this new job. You, you really know the ground uh, that was laid ahead of you. Yes, I do, and we have an amazing commission right now, and there's really been a lot of changes. When you look at, I was in the, the vice chair from 2001 to 2004, and think about all the changes that have happened in our community and around the nation. So there's really opportunity for growth, and I'm looking forward to working with the commission. Mm -hmm. well, Any so last thoughts here? We're just about out of time. Uh, you start the job August 1st, yes. just around the corner, so it's gonna be a pretty, pretty busy summer for you. I'm just really excited to get started um, working with Emily Larson and the, the city and administration. Um, looking forward to working with Mike Tuscan. It's going to be a great ride. It's going to be a difficult ride, but I think we're going to learn a lot. And community is going to play a big part in that. Well, Carl Crawford, Duluth Human Rights Officer, starting the job in just a few weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Yeah. Thanks for. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. This little piggy went to market. In fact, this entire troop of swine was in town to help market superior. Hendrick's racing pigs sped into this community at the invitation of the Business Improvement District. It shows that Superior will, is willing to try almost anything to, to bring people to downtown Superior. We got Oprah swine free! Regardless of whether or not pig racing catches on in Wisconsin, it certainly caught the eye of many residents and out-of-town visitors today. Ludie Mae Calhoun will be on the road two months with these animal athletes, attracting folks back to downtowns across the Midwest. She says the thrill of victory makes her co-workers gluttons for punishment. They get very competitive. You'll find pigs out there cutting off the other pigs so it gets the trophy first, you know. Of course, racing pigs probably won't bring an economic boon to downtown Superior. But if a few more shoppers are drawn into town and everyone has a good time, you can hardly blame business leaders for trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Lisa Blagan, KDLH News. A year or more of campaigning for presidential candidates seeking their respective party's nomination comes to a close this month. The Republican and Democratic national conventions are full of colorful pomp and endless speech making. You can watch it all unfold from the comfort of your living room over the next few weeks, but our guest tonight will have front row seats to the spectacle as delegates to the major party conventions. Joining us is Becky Hall, a delegate traveling to Cleveland for the Republican convention next week, 
And Rich Updegrove is a delegate to the Democratic Convention coming up in two weeks in Philadelphia. And thanks to both of you for being here tonight. Exciting times in politics. Uh, very exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Very yeah. interesting, too. Now, Becky, this will be your second right. Republican National Convention. That's right. So you kind of know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what, it, what it's like when you get into the convention hall and, and you're surrounded by all of these folks and speakers. Well, and 2012 was the first time I, I was fortunate to attend a national convention. It was in Tampa. I went as a first alternate for Congressional District 8. This year, I get to go as a delegate um, for, I'm one of the at-large. I ran at the state convention mm -hmm. for the delegate seat instead of our congressional um, uh, seats. Um, I, it, you know, going to these conventions, it's very exciting. Um, it's, it, there's so much energy. Um, delegates, alternates, guests, they're all excited about, you know, fighting for the, the party and its values and principles and supporting their their nominees at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. it's pretty exciting. And um, aside from the convention, there's plenty of opportunities to meet a lot of the, um, the media, um, a lot of the key players in politics. They're all there. Um, there's plenty of events to participate in, um, documentary films, things like that, that you just soak up politics for about a week. <laughs> now, Rich, you're a social <laughs> studies teacher. Right. Is this your first time as a delegate? Yeah, it's my first time as a delegate. It was a pretty exciting process. I mean, we show up to the caucuses just like everyone else did on, on March 1st, and then you sort of volunteer your name to go to the next level, and from there to the next and the next, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big process. Then it gets to the congressional district level, and six people from congressional district eight got to, to go for the Democrats, and there were four of us for Sanders and two for Clinton. Mm -hmm. And there's one other, uh, Janet Nelson, here in Duluth. So there's two of us from Duluth, and then mm -hmm. the rest of us spread out across northeastern Minnesota. When you entered the, the caucus process, did you kind of have this as the end game in mind? I really hoped I, that I uh -huh. could. I mean, as a social studies teacher, I teach American government and civics, and I really want to bring that to life for our students. I want, I want them to see how exciting it can be and how they can make a difference. And uh, even one of my uh, students who graduated this year um, Michael Mayo, who um, w went to the whole process to be a state delegate and is uh, down at the City Hall tonight, part of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's really great to see young people getting involved and excited. And that's what the Sanders campaign was so much about, which made it exciting as a person who spends most of their life with teenagers. It was great to see them <laughs> being excited about politics. As a first time delegate, do you get a lot of direction from the, the party, from maybe the state party, so, so you know what to expect, you know what you're gonna do when you get there? Well, the DFL has been great. Uh, really trying to lay out what happens each day, helping us with transportation and, and all of the other issues involved. And, and just this Tuesday, it was really fun to be part of a, a large conference call with Bernie Sanders himself and sort, sort of telling us what he expects from us while we're there. And the Clinton campaign is the same sort of, um, you know, coaching and, and, mm -hmm. and work that they do. So it's great to be a part of all of that. Uh, how do you explain the, the Sanders phenomenon on the, on the Democratic side? Because you know, I think at the beginning of the process, people really did not expect Hillary Clinton to have much competition. Mm -hmm. And he came from out of nowhere and really engaged young people. What is it about, about that? Yeah, well, I think a lot, a lot of his politics people have embraced as more uh -huh. mainstream now. He, uh, he, had, he had so much to say about where this country can go in terms of uh, health care being provided to all and public education being extended beyond high school that it, that it should include college. And that really generated a lot of interest, trying to get big money out of politics. These were all you know, really exciting things. And uh, in Duluth, I think 75% of the caucus goers chose Sanders over Clinton. And he had that energy, which was fun to see the older candidate the, the, the graying old man mm -hmm. being the exciting youth candidate in, in this race. So it was, I think a, a lot of his politics have seen um, the more mainstream approach and, and people are ready to embrace that. Now, Becky, uh, you are actually a Cruz delegate heading to the Republican convention. Talk a little bit about that now with Trump, the presumptive nominee. How will that work then for you at, as you cast your ballot at the well, convention? Well, um, you know, getting back to being involved, I, I've been so active in, in our community and politics that from day one of caucus night, um, I was on the uh, leadership team for the state of Minnesota for Ted Cruz, and so I helped to try to organize and get folks out caucus night and go through that whole process as well. It's been rather tumultuous, <laughs> at, to say the least, as we all know. Um, but you know, up until, uh, there's, there's an element in our convention, um, delegates, alternates, where um, there's this never Trump 
um, mm -hmm. attitude, but I think it's a small minority now. I ran as a delegate for the statewide, I'm an at-large um, delegate for the GOP, um, and uh, I found in, the, in recent days here, up until yesterday, there was this conversation about um, never Trump, but I think it's been put to rest. Uh, we had our rules committee uh, wrap up yesterday, and um, I'm one that's of the uh, never Hillary uh, camp. <laughs> um, so I'm going to this convention as well as I think the majority of the delegation that um, we get behind uh, our presidential nominee, uh, Donald Trump, and it's going to be a good convention. I think we've laid to rest some of our divisions. I don't think mm -hmm. it's gone away completely. I think, um, you know, as a, a conservative and, and Ted Cruz being my first choice, we want our, our values. We want to be kind of the conservative conscience of the Republican Party. So we need our voice heard at the convention, but we also need to stand behind mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump. What do you think of uh, Indiana Governor Mike Pence as a running mate? Do you think that he's bringing some of the that conservative value that you're talking about to the ticket? I think so. I think that was a good ticket? choice that um, he chose uh, Governor Pence. I think that um, makes the conservative elements in our party uh, somewhat happy. And um, there's some other things that uh, that Mr. Trump has done along the way to his um, his uh, suggestions for Supreme Court nominees, um, those uh, bode well with conservative uh, thinking folks. So um, I think at the end of the week, we're all gonna be um, fired up and, and getting behind our presidential nominee, Mr. Trump, as well as Governor Pence for Vice President. Now, Rich, uh, Bernie Sanders has now finally endorsed right. Hillary Clinton. As a Sanders delegate, are you comfortable with the concessions the Clinton campaign has made towards Sanders positions? Well, I think the ones that have been made have been great. So she initially was opposed to public education being a tuition free, and she's now proposed a, a middle of the ground, you make $125,000 or less, and you can go to public school at, at no tuition cost. So that's good, and expanding Medicare a bit. Um, I, I think that you know, in, in the end, she, she's come a long way, and I hope that she'll continue to move in that direction to really reach out to uh, those people who were energized by the Sanders campaign to, to bring them into the, to the fold to show that, that she can deliver on those promises. Now, now, you both are obviously very involved in politics, but for the average viewer watching tonight, why, Becky, why should they care about the conventions? Why is this important stuff? Well, it's about the future of our country, and we gotta make sure that we get behind the right candidates and support <laughs> them, and, and so the, the Republicans, they're, they're showing up in Cleveland, and they're, they're gonna get together and, and get behind our, our nominee and um, pay attention. As a matter of fact, my, I'm bringing my daughter, my 19-year-old daughter, as a guest to the convention. She went as a guest in 2012, and I think it's terrific for young people to um, be paying attention listening to what these candidates um, are offering us. Um, uh, I have five uh, kids myself, three of them are in college, and they listen to the rhetoric out there, and some of it is very concerning to them. So um, I think this week and the following week, we're gonna get a good dose of what these candidates stand for, and I hope that um, folks are paying attention because it's about the future of our country. Mm -hmm. Any concerns uh, about security at, at the conventions? Because there have been some pro to protest groups who have threatened to disrupt both conventions. Yeah. Um, but I would, what are they telling you about that? Uh, well, they're not, they haven't said too much in terms of, I mean, you know, obviously the convention itself will be a secure zone and, right. and there's, I don't have any concerns about that. You know, but, but it is, you know, it is concerning. You have, you know, neo-Nazi groups saying they're going to come into the Cleveland and defend uh, against Black Lives Matters protesters. I, I think it is going to be contentious at both conventions and when you have the you know, former uh, Republican presidents not even attending the convention for the Republicans. There's a, there's a lot of divisiveness more, I think, in Cleveland than, than there will be in Philadelphia. But there are also many in Philadelphia who are organizing protests too. And when you see it at the previous rallies that Mr. Trump has had across um, the country, there's been, you know, riots and, mm -hmm. and a little bit of violence there. So it is unsettling, but I do believe that, you know, the security is going to be pretty good and there's a, a good... Uh, periphery where the the police will take good care of us. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be good. Do you anticipate a, a pretty wild ride between now and the actual election? I think so. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think so for sure. Yeah, I think it, and, and and that's that's an entertaining aspect, but also you know something that we all should be really concerned about. You know, this is an election that we should take very seriously, yeah. given given the different choices that we have. 
Mm -hmm. All right, well, I wish we had more time. Um, yeah, thank you so thank much. You Thanks so much. Really safe good. safe travels. Thank Be you. safe while you're there. And, good uh, luck. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. We begin our economic headlines tonight with the latest on the impact of this week's flooding from Business North. Monday night's storm has created a state of emergency for counties in northwestern Wisconsin, where highways including Highway 2, 13, and 63 were closed due to washouts. Officials on the Bad River, Re Bad River Reservation now say Highway 2 should reopen sometime on Monday. And in Hayward, Highway 63 at last reports may also soon reopen. The damage has occurred during the height of this year's tourism season, adversely affecting travelers and commuters. In Bayfield County's officials say the road damage far exceeds what was originally expected. This is Saxon Harbor and Iron County. In addition to hurting business, the washouts have affected the health care for some res residents near Odena, who must be transported elsewhere by helicopter for regular treatments like dialysis. A series of unexpected events occurred this week following the state's decision not to renew mining leases held by SR Steel Minnesota, which has declared bankruptcy. Executives at Cliffs Natural Resources met with state officials and said their company is willing to take over the leases near Nashwalk. Cliffs officials say they could produce iron nuggets within three years after legal proceedings conclude. In response, SR said it has a new investor and a new chief executive officer. So far, lawmakers and Governor Mark Dayton have expressed public support for the Cliffs plan. The Duluth City Council may examine whether the city should implement a very controversial law recently enacted in Minneapolis. Council Pre President Zach Filipovich and Councilor Alyssa Hansen hope to establish a task force that will study whether local companies should be mandated to offer their employees earned sick and personal time off. The councilors contend there's been growing concern about the plight of working families and the number of families facing financial and occupational instability. The Duluth Chamber of Commerce is looking into the issue, but has not yet taken a position. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Call now if you have a comment or a story idea for our show. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. And the WDSE website, it's a great source of information about your favorite program, station events, and the latest program listings. And Greg, speaking of program listings, PBS has a news hour special tonight. It's called America in Black and Blue coming up at 9 o'clock. That's right, and it's a special that looks at the tension between American communities of diversity and the police force. A very, very timely program for what's happening in the country. All right, good show. The News Hour special will preempt our regular programming tonight and should be well worth watching. For Greg and the rest of the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. We'll see you next week. <laughs>